Well, hello everybody. This is Advocate Lucinda, your empowerment lawyer. Well, someone wrote me and said they had a problem with responding to a motion to dismiss. Well, I decided to do a video on responding to a motion to dismiss, particularly for my pro se friends. Okay, so let's get started. What a motion to dismiss is not. It is not the answer to the complaint. The 12B6 motion to dismiss, let's talk about what it is. The motion to dismiss is a written motion by the defendant asking the court to dismiss the plaintiff's complaint. And there are grounds that the defendant will specify that they rely on asking the court to dismiss the plaintiff's lawsuit. They want to get rid of it immediately. Now think about it. Any reasonable attorney would make that move, particularly if they feel like the plaintiff's complaint does not have a case. So we can't blame them for that. But almost always a defense attorney will file a motion to dismiss. And in some jurisdictions, courts encourage it. Those grounds are one, lack of subject matter jurisdiction. In other words, the court must have the authority to hear the matter. Two, lack of personal jurisdiction. The court must have jurisdiction over the party or the person being sued. Three, improper venue. That refers to the judicial district or county where the event or events occurred rising to the lawsuit. Four, insufficient process or insufficient service of process. That refers to a defect in the process of serving the defendant, the summons. Five, failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. In essence, the complaint does not set forth a legal claim for relief. And six, Failure to join a party under Rule 19. And that's a case where the plaintiff didn't include a necessary party, for example. So those are the grounds that the defendant can argue in their request for a dismissal. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, Rule 12, will guide you and give you a better understanding of what the 12B motion is about. You can click, actually, Rule 12 in blue that is underlined, and it will take you to this information regarding the 12B motion to dismiss. Now, so in a nutshell, 
you definitely need to respond to the motion. You need to understand the dismissal. Read the document and get a clear understanding of the grounds that the defendant or defendants are arguing to have this case dismissed. And make sure you understand the ground. Two, develop your counter argument. Three, research. You must research and your response must include law. Without including law, your position has no credence. It's critical. And of course, draft your response. Now, in the next page, I'm going to actually go over a response to a motion to dismiss. So pay attention. Okay. So what we have here is a sample motion to dismiss. And below it is a sample response to a motion to dismiss. The courtesy of the Honorable Marcia S. Krieger, a Colorado United States District Court judge. Now, let me say this at the outset. Plaintiff, your response to the defendant's motion to dismiss should mirror the defendant's motion to dismiss. Let me say that again. Plaintiff, because I am a plaintiff's attorney, so I'll be addressing this video from a plaintiff's perspective. Plaintiff response to the defendant's motion to dismiss should mirror the defendant's motion to dismiss. Let me show you what I mean. Here you have the caption. That's the plaintiff. You see the information? You put exactly what they put. Here is the response to the motion to dismiss. Are you follow me? You're going to mirror the motion to dismiss structurally and substantively. Okay? You have the caption here. You have motion to dismiss. And of course, Plaintiff, yours is going to say response to motion to dismiss. The introduction. Come now. Defendants in this case. Plaintiff, you're going to say comes now if you're one individual. And you put your information. Okay? You follow me? Mirroring. Structurally. And substantively, though, but with a counter argument. Are you following me? Okay, let's go further. Now, here the defendants put their facts. All right, let's give some facts. Pertinent facts. Now. Let's go down to the response. I notice here that this sample does not include facts. But I would suggest that you include facts, particularly if the defendant wrote statements 
that are inaccurate. It doesn't represent your facts, right? Include facts. And if you do include it right here, okay? Let's go up. Now, I am going to deal with this cause of action, Title VII claim only, because this motion deals with uh, Title VII claim and defamation. But I'm just going to demonstrate mirroring using the Title VII claim argument that the plaintiff did not meet the prima facie showing. Okay, Title VII claim. So you're going to mirror argument. Notice that they have argument. One, Title VII claim, A, B, C, subtopics, element two and element four. Well, guess what? Let's look at the structure of your response. One, Title VII claim, A, B, C. Elements two and four. You're just mirroring structurally what the defendant wrote. Now, let's look at it substantively. You're mirroring substantively with a counter argument burden of proof now the plaintiff has the burden of production to come forward with facts demonstrating a prima facie case and we're going up and downs so bear with me here let's look at the counter argument the plaintiff concedes that she bears the burden of production of a prima facie case you see it's a counter argument, but it's one where the plaintiff is saying, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I agree that I bear the burden of production of a prima facie case because that's the law. Don't argue against the defendant when the law is on the defendant's side. And by the way, notice that the defendant cited a case. Please cite a case. Okay. B, this is what the defendant wrote. Elements, the plaintiff must allege that she is a member of a protected class. She was qualified for the position she held. She suffered an adverse employment action. That adverse action occurred in circumstances giving rise to an inference of discrimination. Notice again. They cite the same case, ID at 506. Okay, let's go and mirror that structurally and make our counter argument. So here's the counter argument. B, elements. The plaintiff agrees with the defendant's identification of the elements of a prima facie case. That's a counter argument, but they agree and they should because that's the law, right? As we saw above and notice they didn't have to cite a case in either of these because they agree with the defendants. Okay. Let's go back up. C. Elements not supported by the complaint. Here the defendants allege the complaint does not allege that the plaintiff met the minimum qualification standards for the position she held. Because this is all about trying to dismiss this case. Because if you cannot show the elements, then you have not shown that you can produce a prima facie case. Okay? So, let's go down and counter-argue that. Let's mirror it. C, element two. Plaint 
plaintiff says, paragraph four of the complaint, it, complaint states, which states at all times herein, the plaintiff has been a competent and capable employee, sufficiently alleges that the plaintiff was qualified for her position. You see how they counter argued the defendant's position that the plaintiff did not sufficiently allege elements two and four? Are you getting that? Okay, counter arguing and mirroring. You see the connection here. Okay, so let's go back up and look. At element four, here's what the defendants say. The complaint does not allege any facts demonstrating that the plaintiff was terminated in circumstances giving rise to an inference of discrimination. All right. Let's mirror it structurally and argumentatively, right? Counter argue. Okay, so let's find that here. In counter arguing, plaintiff says paragraph six of the complaint alleges that defendant Jack Smith repeatedly co commented that girls aren't cut out for this kind of work and that referring to the plaintiff and Mary Clark, I don't know why Tom hired the mm, little crybabies in the receiving department. These comments, some directed specifically at the plaintiff, are direct evidence of sex-based discrimination. Now you see where they cite the law here. You follow me? Because they're counter-arguing it. Okay? And they don't agree with the defendant. Okay. So th that's what we mean by mirroring. Make it easy on yourself. But you've got to conduct your research and your response, your counter argument has got to mirror your facts. Okay? And lastly, you want to do a conclusion, right? Even though this one does not have uh, the, the term conclusion, I would I would go on and put you know a title, a heading, conclusion, okay? And of course, you want to date it and sign it. Do not forget your certificate of service. Certificate of service is critical. That's easy to locate the find. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Motion to dismiss of the defendant. I can assure you they've shown you what a certificate of service looks like. Let me make this suggestion to you. Be as structurally appeasing as you possibly can, as well as substantively. Why do I say that? To the court. Because the judges have a lot. Keep in mind, they don't know you. They don't know the defendants for the most part. They're hearing from you. And they can only rely on what they get from you. So number one, make sure you give them, the court, everything they need. Make sure it is nicely packaged. I'm talking about structure now. That's why I'm suggesting that you mirror the defendant's document because first impressions, they do mean something. And the readability, the neatness of documents, they do mean something. Okay? 
So it's okay to mirror the, and you should mirror the defendant's motion to dismiss structurally because that really helps the court to follow the case in sequence. It, it helps the court. Okay? Substantively, work on it. Do the best job you can. Don't frustrate the court. The judges, they really, I think most judges, they do a impressionable, sincere attempt to get it right. If you structure your response, follow the defendant. That will help you a great deal. Okay. All right. Now, I have also provided you a link where you can see this sample and you can actually download it and then edit it, tailor it to your needs. This is the actual document that we just went over. Click this link and download it and you can work from it. Okay? And I have given you the link to my legal channel right here. Be sure to review that. I have numerous videos concerning employment discrimination. I have a video on summary judgment. I have a video on how to start a complaint from filing the EEOC to responding to the motion for summary judgment. And while you are there, subscribe. And lastly, check out my website, Advocate lucinda.org both links are right here and just click them okay i hope this has been helpful to you and until next time advocate lucinda your empowerment lawyer take care